All right, Revelation chapter 13, and we're going to look at verse 4. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 4. Okay, what is important to understand concerning this beast that came up out of the sea, as we all know that it is the main body of a leopard, but the feet is the feet of a bear, as you might recall. And then you'll also notice that he has the mouth of a lion. He has the mouth of a lion. So, I'm not the best, uh, I'm not the best of drawings, as you might already know that. But anyway, so this beast, he has the mouth that is of, like a lion. That looks like a possum, man. <laughs> or armadillo, okay. Okay, there we go. Okay, that's somewhat better, okay. So notice over here that he'll have the mouth of a lion, the body of a leopard, and the feet of a bear. As we come across this beast, we also studied that it has about seven heads and ten horns. So because it has seven heads, we're going to put one, two, three, four, five, and then six. All right? So he's supposed to have seven heads surrounding it as well. He comes up out of the sea, and we mentioned that it would most likely be the Mediterranean Sea. Because it is at an area where it's a huge body of water, and also the sea where Jews and Syrians, it will be a great location for it. Remember, the Antichrist is a Syrian Jew. He is a Syrian Jew. But then we also pointed out that his ethnicity is Syrian Jew by religion and position, he is a pope. As the dragon gives this beast his power, notice that the verse reads over here, at verse 4, they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him. So notice that the passage says right here, that as the dragon gives his power to the beast, that the whole world, okay, so remember this is verse by verse Bible study, right? So notice how I explain each verse, that way it will match. So notice it says that, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So the whole world is seeing this beast as invincible. Why? What happened? Because, as your pastor mentioned before, he was uh, going three days, probably, three days, three nights, dead. But then your pastor mentioned that he was assassinated. When he was assassinated, then what he did was that he raised himself from the dead. By raising himself from the dead, he can imitate and prove that he is like Jesus Christ, which of course he is not. And then the dragon, what he does is that he manifests and provides him his power and his seat. By comparing that seat, we see Rome is most likely the seat for it. And because it is most likely the seat for it, the Antichrist hence must be a pope. The beast, a lot, some people think, and I think some Seventh-day Adventists are actually guilty of this, but a lot of them, they like to make the beast as a system rather than a person. And they like to say that it has to, the mark of the beast has to apply with observing Sunday. So in other words, so this is ridiculous. You can laugh if you want to. But Ellen G. White, batty as she is, she mentioned that the mark of the beast is when you attend Sunday church service. So we all took the mark of the beast, you know. So, so a lot of the Seventh-day Adventists, they revise the teachings where they're trying to say, we're not saying it, it is right now. We're not saying that you have the mark of the beast right now because they know how loony they look when they say that. So then they'll say it's going to happen in the future when the Antichrist sets up his system. He's going to make the mark of the beast a system where it is uh, denying the Sabbath and worshiping God on Sunday. Now, they also say that, so that's one error. The second thing is, because they believe it's a system, they do not believe, they do not really emphasize or point out that it's a person. Some of them might agree it might be a person, but then there are others who do not believe it's a person. It's the system. 
All right, now, first of all, you want to read the Bible as it says, not what somebody tells you what the interpretation should be. Notice that it's personified when you look at verse 4. Who is like unto the what? Beast. Who is able to make war, war with who? Notice it says him. Look at verse 5. It says him. Verse 5 repeats twice, him. You'll notice verse 3, his head. See that? Verse 2, his feet. He, dragon gave him his power. See that? Notice verse 1. It says his horns, his heads. It's a, notice verse 6. He opened, notice, his mouth. That's a person, Amen. not a system. Amen. Okay? Last time I've seen it, I don't think, I don't see a system with the mouth on it. Read my lips. It doesn't say that. So notice that this is a person here who has a mouth. You'll notice over verse 7, him. Verse 8, him. You'll also notice at verse 18, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, colon, the beast, for it is the number of a what? Man. Man. He's a person. It is not a thing or a neuter it. So don't let Seventh-day Adventists fool you. So, looking at Revelation, chapter 13, by context, the Antichrist is clearly, clearly a person. Okay? He is not just a system. He is a person. Now, it is true, they're going to point you out verses that this is referring to a kingdom because we covered it at verse 1 through 2. We covered the kingdoms, right, that make up this Antichrist leopard. So we mentioned about the kingdoms that make up for it, which your pastor is not going to repeat again. So USA for the body of the leopard, feet of a bear, Russia, mouth of a lion, England. So because they see kingdoms and systems here, that might be one way that they could justify it. However, in the Bible, it is true that when God gives visions about the beast, that it would be a kingdom. But you got to realize it's, it's, not, uh, it's not isolated to just a kingdom. It's a, a king, person, and a kingdom. And you're going to see these things interchange. That's one thing you've got to understand. Let's look at a few examples over here. Look at Revelation chapter 17 and Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 17. Now notice it can go king and kingdom. King and kingdom. Daniel chapter 7 and Revelation chapter 17. I mean, we already saw plainly from Revelation 13 the pronouns, and then the Bible also says man at Revelation 13. Clearly, by reading the verse as it says, rather than a made-up interpretation that it's a system or just a kingdom, if you read as it says, we see that Revelation 13 points out the Antichrist is a person. It is true that system and kingdom follows along with the king and a person, but that's the point. The point is, is that it's not limited to a system and kingdom. System and kingdom can't exist if there is no king, see, or person running it. Okay, so let's look at Revelation chapter 17. Now, notice how scripture, with scripture reveals the answer concerning about king and kingdom for the beast. And it's not limited to just one thing. All right, Revelation 17 verse 10. And there are seven what? Kings. Kings. Five are fallen and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast, right? The beast? The beast? That was and is not even he is the what? Eighth and is of the what? Seven what at verse 10? Seven what? Kings. So the beast is a what? King. Not just a kingdom. Now let's go to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Look at verse 23, verse 23. The word of God reads, Thus he said, the fourth beast, so that's the Antichrist kingdom, okay, shall be the fourth what? 
kingdom, not king, kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms. So we already read who this fourth beast is. It's a tariff. Uh, your pastor showed it to you last time. I'm not going to show it again. But remember, there were four beasts in Daniel. And the fourth one was this beast that John saw at Revelation 13. Okay, so it's repeating that same beast, but notice it's called a kingdom. Yeah. So notice right here, it's a king and kingdom. That's how it works. That's what makes more sense. Amen. Now go to Revelation 13 again. Revelation 13. Now let's assume that this has to do with uh, Sunday observance, okay? Mark of the beast. Now let's look at the passage over here. This is ridiculous, man. Let's look at verse 16, okay? And he calls us all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the what? Mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now look at that right there. So notice over here that you can't buy or sell unless you have the mark, name, and number of the name. Now think about it, I mean, you take the verse literally. That's the first rule of interpretation. Think, use your common sense. What economic market works out where you can't buy or sell unless you have a name, unless you have a number, or a mark? There's your credit card right there. See that? But this is going to be uh, more so where the verse says at verse 16, it's going to go in your right hand or in your forehead. And... My friend, when you study technology, it's getting closer where it's not just a credit card. Now it's to your phone, hitting to your watch. Then what's next? Somewhere close to the hand. And now they're doing stuff where it's going to reach the forehead. So check it out, man. Check it out. So this would make more sense that what does this have to do with Sunday observance? What in the world, man? I mean, we're not having a market at church. As a matter of fact, God hates that more. God, uh, Jesus, when they were uh, doing market stuff at the temple, you know what Jesus did? He overthrew it and says, it should not be a marketplace. It's a house of prayer. So to say that this is uh, assimilated with Sunday service is totally contrary. It doesn't make sense. Okay, let's look at Revelation 13 again. Okay, so verse 4, they brag about the beast. No one can make more with him, right? Now verse 5, there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things. So the beast is able to speak great things, a lot of charisma, where the whole world will listen. Hmm. And blasphemies. But it is blasphemous. And power was given to him. So he has worldwide power. Think of a figure today who would receive religious worship, verse 4, right? So he's got to be religious because of verse 4. They worship the beast. So he's got to be religious. Think of a religious leader who has worldwide power, who has great charisma in speaking at verse 5, and yet it is blasphemous to the Lord. Think of the best candidate for that. That's the Pope figure. That's the Pope figure. So notice right here that we see case after case where it is pretty strong, that this Antichrist is going to be like a Pope figure. Let's establish a few cases here. We mentioned one case was verse 2, his seat. And we found out that Rome's the best candidate. Another one right over here is verse 4 through 5. A religious leader who has worldwide power, speaks great things, but is blasphemous to God. So all these cases can point out that this is a really good candidate for a pope. A lot of people think the pope is a false prophet. And to be quite honest, I can be open to that. The reason why is because amongst Bible believers, it's a division of opinion concerning about if the pope is going to be false prophet or antichrist. I think he can be a great case for both, <laughs> false prophet and antichrist. He totals the whole package of evil. But uh, jesting... <laughs> But jesting aside, sarcasm aside, um, I see him more of a case as the Antichrist figure based on these following verses, but we'll look at more cases, okay? We'll look at more cases later on as we keep reading. Now, notice right here that verse 5 says, to continue 40 and 2 months. 
So notice over here that this Antichrist, the key word over here is continue. You notice that? Not start, but continue. Continue, what? 42 months. Now, if you calculate 42 months, what does that equal? Three and a half years. Is that correct? Your pastor told you over and over again what's all over the book of Revelation is three and a half years, three and a half years, three and a half years. Mm -hmm. So when they mention about 1,200 and I think 60 days, or when they mention 42 months, or a time, time, and half a times, that language wording of timing, uh, no matter how you interpret it, it all comes down to three and a half years. We can see it that way. That's the most logical opinion. Now, your pastor is sticking toward the traditional interpretation of the time length of the tribulation as seven years, although he is open to other timelines, as I've mentioned before. But the reason why this would, uh, I would feel like that this would support seven years is because some people say the tribulation is only three and a half years long, but it says right here, continue three and a half years. Why? Because remember, he was ruling before. Remember that? He got assassinated. So it shows me right here that I think a seven-year case would be the more logical interpretation. It would be the more logical interpretation that it will be a seven-year period. Okay. So let's look at verse 6. Verse 6. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. So when he speaks, it blasphemes God. To blaspheme his name. So when he speaks in blasphemy, what it desecrates are the following. It desecrates God's name. It also desecrates his tabernacle. So heaven is blasphemed. His name is blasphemed. And notice over here, and them that dwell in heaven. God's people, the saints up in heaven, are blasphemed. So notice God's heaven, God's name, and God's people are all blasphemed by this particular person. Think about it. Whenever he speaks out, doesn't this figure speak blasphemy against those three things? Yes, he does. When the Pope speaks out that this, these dumb Catholic dogmas, that they have the power to forgive sins, to shut up heaven uh, for those who are not qualified for heaven and open up the gates of heaven for those uh, they allow into heaven, isn't that blaspheming his heaven? Yeah. Isn't it blaspheming his name when the Pope put, uh, wears a hat that goes, uh, if my memory is correct, Vicarious Philly Day? Now, that's the thing where some people propose at verse 1, which your pastor was unsure of. Remember, he, upon his heads, the name of blasphemy? I wasn't sure what that was, but a strong candidate for that is Vicarious Philly Day, what the Pope is wearing on his hat. And I heard that if you uh, count it out with Latin inscriptions translated into numbers, that can go 666. So y'all can do some research on that one just to make sure. But I'm just telling you from what I know, which could be wrong. But it is very interesting, though. It seems like the strongest candidate so far. So we see right here that this would perfectly then match up again for it to be what? A pope figure again. See that? All these things point out that the Antichrist would be a pope figure. It would make a lot more sense. Doesn't he desecrate God's people as well? Yeah, he speaks blasphemy about God's people where he professes uh, where uh, there's St. Jojo and St. Mary and uh, St. Judas Iscariot, you know, St. Lucifer or whoever, that uh, if you pray to and they can forgive you of your sins and stuff like that, that blasphemy is God's saints, his Amen. people up in heaven. Amen. That's blasphemy. So notice right here that you can see how the Pope can really match up with all of this. To be quite honest, I don't see how, uh, if you don't want the Pope to be the Antichrist, what I would like to ask is this, is that I don't see a verse in here that challenges that. In other words, that criticizes the Pope cannot fit this bill. 
Because when you read all of Revelation 13, it seems to fit. Mm -hmm. Unless you see a verse where it contradicts, then I could say that there's a strong case for that. Okay, so let's look at uh, verse 7. It was given unto him. So S Satan incarnate, the Antichrist, was given power by Satan himself to make war with the saints. So the tribulation saints, they're going to go through war against the Antichrist and to overcome them. So the tribulation saints, they lose the battle against the Antichrist. Why? Because he has the world power. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So the Antichrist has a power that rules over all sorts of kindreds, so all kinds of tribes of people, groups of people, and tongues, different languages, and nations, all nations around the world. Verse 8, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. So everybody around the world, they're going to worship him. Now remember, if you recall, at Revelation chapter 6, the Antichrist was going forth conquering and to conquer. So he did not have the whole world bent under, under his uh, feet that time. If you read Daniel chapter 11, there seemed to be a conflict as well. There was like a conflict of rogue nations who would not submit under the Antichrist power. Uh, your pastor also mentioned before that, was it Revelation chapter 9? When we go back to Revelation 9 about the four angels who were loosed out of Tartarus, that possibly, I could be wrong, but possibly, that it looked like they were supporting the rogue nations, the communist allies, so to speak, while the Antichrist, he was revving up uh, his own group, trying to maintain his world order. So... It seems like over here th throughout that the Antichrist, he had conflict with different nations who would not listen to him. You'll notice Revelation chapter 6, that is definitely proven in Matthew 24 because there was war <laughs> between nations. So the Antichrist did not get full control. But over here now, it seems like that he's got full control at verse 8. See that? So if we take this uh, passage in order where we go the seven seals, remember those seven seals? If we put these four horsemen at the beginning timeline of the tribulation, it would make more sense. And then the latter three and a half years, where the Antichrist has more full control this time, rather than nations contradicting each other at, uh, during the first four horsemen. So that's why we see more and more, I see more and more here that it's a uh, seven year would fit more of a time gap the timeline. Now a lot of people say, but the Bible says three and a half years all over the Bible. That's true, but here's the thing is that if you go, if the Bible talks about three and a half, three and a half, three and a half all the time, you can put it this way. Three and a half, three and a half is what? Seven. See? And it mentions three and a half not just once, but what? Multiple times. So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't disprove seven just because it says three and a half. As a matter of fact, if it talks about three and a half, it can be focusing on segments of it. Yeah. And then if it's talking about different segments, then it equals to seven. Mm 